From WBNE. Hi, I'm Carrie. And I'm Jade. And we're the Curly Critics. And today we're talking about Prince Caspian. I am literally so excited. I know I said that last week. I don't care. Freaking excited. Prince Caspian came out in 2008, and it was also directed by Andrew Adamson. And this movie has Ben Barnes in it. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Carrie's a little insane. Forgive her. Shadow and Bone just came out. What's your history with this movie? Oh wait, is it the same as last week? A little bit. I do have a little bit of a twist, though. There's some stuff I forgot, so that's cool. I did talk last week about how I got the DVD. I love that DVD more than anything. Um, Another thing, one of the only video games I have ever finished all the way through, like 100%, is the DS version of Prince Caspian. Wow. It's fantastic. Like, it is one of my favorite games. It's really hard. Um, One of my favorite parts is when you're doing battle and you really need help, you can literally blow into the microphone, into the DS, and, like, blow Susan's horn. And that is so cool to me. Like, (laughs) I don't know why. I just think that's really fun. (laughs) So, like... I don't know. That game, it's so hard, but I've finished it, like, twice now. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, because you get, like, a lot of story time, obviously, but you get a lot of, like, fighting ugly creatures and dying. So Classic. Yeah. Is it really a video game if you don't die while fighting ugly creatures? (laughs) No, it's not. Anyways, and you watched it this week. Yeah. (laughs) That's my history. So, I did not like this movie as much as the first one. (gasps) Okay. I've seen it twice now, and... I I really just need to go to therapy for that. (laughs) I don't... (laughs) I don't know how to process my feelings. That is step number two. The first thing, (laughs) this movie is two and a half hours long. So was the first one. It's longer than the first one by only a few minutes, but it's longer. Maybe the so we talked are about. You and don't know. We talked about in the first episode about how movies are too long, <laughs> but that movie was too long, and this See, movie was even longer. I have never felt that way about these movies. Like Star Wars is really long. It's like two hours. Yeah. The original like, movies game, are so boring. Is almost three hours. Yeah, I don't know I mean, how I sat through Endgame. Yeah, like, I don't know. I just, even Hacksaw Ridge, three hours long, at least, at minimum. And it felt like five minutes. Please don't give me more reasons never to watch that movie. <laughs> Listen, I will die on this hill. <laughs> I just, I don't know, I've never had a problem with long movies unless they just suck. And I don't feel that way about any of these, so. (laughs) A lot happens in this movie. Yeah. That's what I think book-to-movie adaptations in particular fail or they hurt from the fact that you can put more in a book than you can in a movie. Yeah. In all senses. So either you cut a bunch of stuff out and it's not as faithful to the book as it was before and people get upset about that or you don't cut a lot out and then it becomes really long and then you have a really long movie. But if it's more faithful to the book and it's not boring, what does it matter? Yeah, I just thought that parts of this were a little boring. No! No. I don't... We're here's... Fight. Here's... <laughs> I like that they're doing more book adaptations as TV shows. Yeah. One, because you can be more faithful that way. Two, because I can stop after the an episode. 
Right. Like, I hardly ever sit down and read an entire book in one sitting. And with really long movies, like this one, that's what they're asking me to do, is sit down and read a book in an entire sitting. And it's a lot of information. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I like having those moments. Sometimes it's hard to find those moments where you can just sit and chill out for three hours. Like, it's usually really hard to find. That's why I don't watch a lot of movies during the school year, because I can't find moments like that. But it is really nice. Just, like, getting to chill. It's a lot of information, but I... I like longer movies as long as they're good. That's fair. I just disagree with you. (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. Remind me to never watch Endgame with you. (laughs) I've watched Endgame again recently, and that one's fine. I think it's... Endgame has a lot of background writing on it and a lot of hype writing on it. Where I'm yeah. incredibly emotionally connected to all of the characters. That's true. So I'm incredibly yeah. invested into what happens to them. I'm invested in what happens into the Pevensey children, but less so. Yeah, that's definitely fair. I don't know. I just... I relate to them better because they're more realistic. Obviously, they're just like normal kids. It's harder to relate to superheroes. You're like, oh, I want to be this one, or I want to be whatever. And it's like, well, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't relate to the Avengers. I just like them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm just like Hulk. (laughs) Yikes. (laughs) Big yikes. But this movie does a lot of jumping back and forth between scenes. It does. That I was, like, writing out what was happening, and it was, like, one sentence, and then it was, like, at a completely different scene with completely different characters. And I... I mentioned in the first movie how all of the scenes seemed somewhat disconnected from each other, and you were like, that's a plus, because then you can point out particular scenes. Mm -hmm. This movie does the exact opposite of that. (laughs) Yeah, it's almost like it's disconnected, but so much so that you're not really sure what comes one after the other. Yeah. I watched this movie a week ago for the first time with my roommates, and I was incredibly confused for most of the movie. Yeah. And I watched it again, and I was paying more attention to what was going on, and I was less confused, but I could completely understand how I got so confused the first time. Yeah. Things, important plot points happen so quickly, and it's usually just, like, this one person said this thing, and if you weren't paying attention, you missed it. It's really subtle, and I wish when you had watched it the first time, I wish either I or your roommates had said, like, you need to pay attention because it's gonna go by fast and you're gonna miss something, and then the whole movie's not gonna make sense. Yeah, that just upsets me. <laughs> in a, like, I don't know. movie format, if I can't yeah. make, like, if I have to be 100% glued to it 100% of the time to, like, even make sense of what's happening, I feel like that's, they're giving me too much or they're not giving me the information well enough. Especially yeah. in a, like, um, verbal, like, they're all, almost every, all the plot points happen verbally. Yeah. Instead of, like, we don't see them happen. Like, the horn, we hear somebody tell Caspian that this is important. Yeah. We never get to really see that, like, we see that it's important. But it's, everything that happens is explained through words and not visuals, and so it's harder to follow. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. I think they They manage to hit everything in the book well enough that it's like, okay, this is a good book-to-movie adaptation that makes more sense if you've read the book first. Like, you can still follow if you've watched the movies. I followed just fine as a kid. Maybe not to such a deep level. And I think that's the other thing, is this movie, I feel, was more written for 
kids in the sense that kids aren't going to pay attention the entire time. Kids have been ADD forever. Like, they're just squirming around, barely paying attention. I've seen this movie a bunch of times, so it's like, oh, I finally caught everything after watching it a million times. <laughs> so... But if it's for kids... And kids don't pay attention as much. Why are all of the details so subtle? Why are the plot points so subtle? Because they don't matter as much. But without them, the movie doesn't make sense. As a kid, that didn't matter. All I yeah. really cared about was the characters. Was about, oh, this weird random prince is trying to take over? That's kind of weird. I thought he was a bad guy. No, he's a good guy. Okay, these other guys are trying to kill him. It was very much just who's the good guy versus who's the bad guy and who's going to win in the end. It wasn't so much about the politics of it all because it is kind of a political movie. Like, so as a kid, you're... I don't know, you're just more focused on the big picture. Yeah. I thought the children in this movie were more cringy than they were in the first movie. That, like, their lines were more, like, quips between six-year-olds than they were well-written plot li or, like, dialogue. Yeah, I noticed that, too, like... The actors didn't get worse. They weren't given as good of a script to deal with. So yeah. they did the best they could. Right. Like, I know it's not the actors because they did really well in the first movie. I know it's the dialogue. The mm -hmm. the script that they were given. Yeah. But there were, there were some good lines. Yeah. Even, like, you were talking about being confused. And even my mom, she's seen this movie a million times with me. Even she was confused watching it. And I was like it happened just there like we just saw it but it's one of those if you are not paying attention the whole time it's like the movie inception if you're not paying attention to that movie the entire time you're gonna have no idea what's happening you're gonna be so lost the whole time yeah i've never watched that movie all the way through because i started it and i wasn't paying attention i got confused and gave up and was like i'll get back to this when i have more time and it's been yeah. like six years <laughs> I just, I love movies and I love TV shows with little things to pick out. And with this movie, it's not fair because you're right. Those things are really important for the plot. But I love picking those little things out and going, oh, they said this. That's why he did this. Oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah, I like being able to pick things out. I just wish they weren't so important to the plot. Like, I think Marvel movies do it really well, where the plot, base level, pretty easy to understand. Same with um, Pixar movies. Mm -hmm. The plot's pretty easy to pick out, but they have lots of Easter eggs, where if you really wanted to dig deep, if you really wanted to pay attention, you'd notice things that either point to what's going to happen later in the movie, point to another movie, point to the next movie that's coming... And so, like, there's this opportunity for the world to be more explored and to, like, have layers to it. But when you first watch it, you get the plot. And so it gives you a reason to keep watching it. That's not to try and figure out what's going on. Yeah. No, that definitely... It might just be sequel syndrome. Yeah, that's also a possibility. It very well could be. I am wondering, like... What what parts of the plot did you not get the first time around that the second time you're like, oh, yeah, totally got it? Yeah, I'm going to go through it and I'm going to mention them when they come talking okay. about the plot. So this movie starts and I was immediately confused. <laughs> but um, so this woman gives birth to a baby. It's a boy. And... This professor wakes up Prince Caspian and tells him he has to leave because his aunt has given birth to a son. And basically, Prince Caspian runs away, runs into the Narnians, and blows the horn to 
try and prevent them from capturing him. Something like that. It's it's a confusing turn of events. Basically, he runs away and blows the horn. And we learn that his uncle doesn't like him and is trying to kill him. And that the horn is important. Yeah. But when I first watched it, I was confused as to why they were trying to kill Caspian. Okay. Like, right I mean, off that the... that has to do with royal lineage. Right. So... But right off the bat, like, we get introduced to, like, seven characters right at the beginning. And they're immediately trying to kill Caspian. And then there's Baby involved and he's running away. And then there's a horn. And it all happens very quickly. Mm-hmm. And rewatching it again, I learned that they explained that a lot it took them a lot longer to explain that like throughout the movie yeah and i just had my roommates explain it when i first watched it because they've all seen it before but that was i've discovered with books especially that i don't particularly like books that do that where they give you a bunch of explanation exposition without any explanation until like halfway through the book i prefer the like this is what the plot's going to be, and then you, like, read to see what the plot's going to be. Yeah. I don't know. I just, if they do it well enough, I can handle that. Yeah. There are some books where I'm, like, doing it, and I'm, like, I don't know what's going on, but I like the writing style, and I like the characters, and I like what's happening, so I'm going to keep going. That's me with this. That, yep. (laughs) Yeah. So... Caspian blacks out and blows the horn, and we transition to the real world, where Lucy gets almost run over by a car, and she has to get Susan because Peter's gotten into a fight, and Edmund backs him up, and then the fight breaks up, and they're waiting for the train, reminiscing about how they missed their time in Narnia, pretty mm-hmm. much. My One of my favorite lines was the, like, kid that was talking to Susan at the beginning, like, walks up, and Susan's like, pretend you're talking to me. And they go, we are talking to you. (laughs) That's my favorite. I just also love there that Edmund and Peter are, like, brothers, and, like, Edmund, like, comes to his aid and, like, helps him in the fight, but as soon as the fight is over, they go back to hating each other. It's amazing. It really... Mm. I I love the sibling relationships in these movies. Yeah. It's done My so favorite well. is Peter and Lucy and I just need more of that. Okay? Rip. <laughs> Enough. It's fine. Don't you worry about it. So, they're waiting on the train station and all of a sudden a magical, por- a magical portal shows up and they're transported to Narnia because of Caspian's horn. Mm-hmm. And they immediately play in the water, and they're trying to figure out what they are, and Edmund's like, I don't remember ruins in Narnia. And they go and explore the ruins and discover that it's their old palace Mm -hmm. that was left in ruins because it's been a long time since they were there last. Mm -hmm. Ruined by catapults, which is also really important. (laughs) Yeah, that hasn't happened yet. I wrote that down. Well, I just mean, like, that's, he's like, oh, it was ruined by catapults. I'm like, oh my gosh, Edmund. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they do a lot of building, like, unfolding the mystery. Mm Mm-hmm. So, like, like the first 45 minutes of this movie are like, okay, so what's the problem? (laughs) Yeah, because they're just summoned there. They have no idea what they're doing. They think... Aslan's done it, and they're like, wait, all this time has gone by, everyone's dead now, we don't know anyone here, we don't know of another prophecy that's supposed to happen, where is everyone? Yeah. So I think it is an important build-up to have, like, yeah. what's happening? I agree. I mean, it's important. The plot doesn't work if you don't build up the mystery. Mm -hmm. So after the kids start exploring the ruins, we cut back to the Telmarines. And Caspian's uncle is acting like the king and the Council of Lords are upset with him. And we learn that Caspian's dad has died. 
and that Caspian has disappeared. And the uncle gives this elaborate speech about how it's the Narnians, look at this dwarf we captured, they stole Caspian, we have to attack them. Yeah. So now we have a plot point. Yeah. We still don't fully know what's going on yet, but we have a plot point. And then we come back to the kids, where they're in their old vault, and they find all their belongings, their swords, and their bow and arrow. And they leave, and they find the dwarf that was captured by the Telmarines. Mm -hmm. And they save his life, and then the dwarf realizes that they're the Narnian kings and queens of old. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they have a really pointless sword fight. I love it. Where the dwarf is like, <laughs> oh yeah, you really are what I, you said you are. And then yeah, they go on a journey to find the other There's a whole Narcans. thing about like, you're not exactly what I expected. And they're like, I mean, back at you, buddy. I don't... <laughs> it's just... This whole movie I started to realize was like was everyone underestimating them. Like, oh, you're not what I expected. I expected you to be older. I expected you to be this or that. And I liked that sword fight in that, at least for him, that's what he needed to be able to be like, oh, I need to follow these people. Like, I need to keep up with these guys because they're the real deal. He has swordsmanship that he should not have at 15. Or however right. old. So the dwarf and the Pens- Pevensey children go out to find the other Narnians. And then we cut to Caspian. <laughs> and Caspian's been knocked out in the house of a badger. And Caspian explains that he's a prince, the Prince Caspian, and his uncle's trying to kill him. And then we cut to Caspian's uncle. Who gets yeah. angry that the professor never told him about the kings and queens of old coming back. Yeah, so when Caspian's explaining his story, I really like that scene because that's when he explains why they're trying to kill him. They're like, wait, that's yeah. not right. And so that's when it gets explained and I'm like, oh, that's that's what we need right there is, well, he's trying to kill me because he had a son. And they're like oh, that's why you're here. You're here to help us. So I really like that explanation there. It comes kind of late, but it's there. Yeah, I feel like this format that this movie is in is better done in a book. Yeah, and I think once you read the book, you'll be like, oh, got it. Because there are even some subtle lines that you probably wouldn't pick up on unless you read it. Ah. Yeah. So, Caspian's uncle is angry. Caspian gets the help of a dwarf and a badger to help him find the other Narnians. And then we jump to Lucy. (laughs) Not yet. They're not running away yet? Not yet. I'm telling you, it jumps so much. So, yeah. then we meet the- we go back to the Pevensey children and the dwarf, and Lucy discovers that animals don't talk anymore and almost dies because of a bear. <laughs> and then it occurred to me, before this point, like when in the first movie when they were there, if all the animals could talk, Does that mean most of the Narnians are vegetarian? Because, like, they have emotional connections. They're, like, human-like. All of the animals. I mean... I wouldn't say no. I just thought that was interesting. I kinda like that. I don't know. Unless they, like, had fish, maybe. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if the fish talk... Pescatarian? Let me just Google real quick. Are Narnians pescatarian? (laughs) I mean, in the third movie, the birds don't talk. Right. 
So I guess not all of the animals talk. It's just interesting. I don't know. So then we jump back to Caspian, who has come up against his uncle's evil army, and he just stands there looking all Ben Barnes-like, and watches as the entire army gets taken down by a mouse. I love him. Ripicheep is the best Narnia character of all time, and you can't prove me wrong. I mean, like, Peter's okay, but... (laughs) But he's not Ripicheep. A fair point. He just... Him at the end, I'm just like, ah, stop. You're so good. I love him. He's even better in the next movie. Ugh, he's so incredible. I just can't. So, then Reaper Cheap and Caspian form an alliance, and they lead Caspian to the other Narnians. Then we jump back to Peter <laughs> and the gang. And Peter has such a large ego in this movie that it's almost annoying. Yeah. And so I can tell that Peter's back in Narnia to learn about himself and, like, how to figure out his life, how to be a leader, how to be an adult. Yeah, to learn humility, to learn how to be a team player. I have no idea why Susan came back, but... I mean, when you know the entire story, it doesn't make sense. When you just have one book, like one movie, it's like, oh, she came back to learn... I don't know. How to not be a snob? I don't... No, like, straight up. I don't think Susan learned anything this whole movie. Yeah, she learned about boys. Great. Susan that came back to Narnia to learn about mad. boys. That made me so mad. I was like, that is so out of character for Susan. She just... Like, there's nothing logical about her liking Caspian. And I get it. Love isn't logical. Eh, whatever. I actually disagree with you. It... Her thing they... with him... I used to like it. I used to be like, oh my gosh, that's really sweet. It just frustrated me. Because even at the end, they're like, this doesn't make any sense. It wouldn't have made sense anyways. And then they never see each other again. And it's like... I think the fact... And we're cutting, like, two hours in the movie, but... (laughs) Well, I I think... I think the fact that they kissed is a little weird. Yeah it's pointless like why then why didn't they do it earlier but that's not the point i like they are sending like lusty eyes at each other the whole movie i know and i hate that (laughs) so i don't think it's like completely weird yeah like susan's whole thing is that she wants to be an adult yeah that makes sense And she, like, meets a guy who's, like, pretty, and, like, that's, like, the first step into, like, being an adult. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It's Ben Barnes. We get it. I... I'm not jealous? No. That's... No. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, I don't know. And the whole, like, oh, he's the knight in shining armor. He saves her, whatever. I'm like, that's so dumb. (laughs) <laughs> and when he, when he and Peter are all worried about her falling off this cliff or whatever, I'm like, why? You barely know this girl. It doesn't make any sense. They don't talk to each other. Yeah, I think she it says like two been done things to him, better. and it's so dumb. It could have been done better. Susan's character really got sidelined in this movie. Yeah. No. Definitely. But Which it's is not like called Susan. Yeah, there's just so many things that have to happen in this movie that they cannot develop all four of the children's character mm-hmm. arcs. So, Peter and the gang 
go to a giant cliff because Peter's like, this is the way we have to go. And the dwarf is like, no, you're stupid. And they get there and the river is not the same as it was a thousand years ago when they were last there. It's fine. And Lucy sees Aslan and no one believes her except for Edmund because Edmund's learned his lesson. (laughs) I loved that. I was like, character development, yes! Yes. But, basically, they're all like, Lucy, you're dumb. We're gonna go this way now. Which I also thought that was a little weird, that this Aslan thing was a theme throughout the whole movie, but the way it gets fulfilled is a little weird, where Aslan's like, why didn't you come to me sooner? But there was no... Like, they just were like, Oh yeah, we, we haven't mentioned Aslan in like 20 minutes. Mention him again throughout the whole movie. And it didn't seem like there was a real pull or reason to go to Aslan. Until I right think... at the end when they went to him. Yeah, it was just like that first moment, I feel like, is what he was referencing to. Because I thought about that too. I was like, well, when would she have had the chance? She just wasn't following her instinct. She was trying to follow her brother, just trying to do the right thing. I don't know. I think he was solely talking about that one moment of, oh, he's right there. No, you're wrong. You're crazy. We're going this way instead. Yeah, and eventually Lucy is like, no, we have to go this way. Like, let's go to Aslan. And they, like, go in the direction of Aslan, and it, like, leads them in the right direction, and then they meet Caspian. So, he's up to something. And it was definitely interesting, because when she's talking to him later, she's like, if I had gone sooner, would all of those people have died? And he's like, well, we'll never know that. And it's such a good, like, real-life reflection. These movies are so good with life lessons of like you didn't do the right thing the first time you luckily got a second chance so things didn't go even worse than they did (laughs) but i don't know i really liked that part yeah this movie is way darker than i was anticipating when we started watching it yeah yeah so we Caspian's meeting with the Narnians and convincing them that he's on their side and they should help him because he's going to unite everybody together. Mm -hmm. And then Lucy leads the gang towards Aslan and they meet up with Caspian and Peter and Caspian fight. And then from this point on we have to deal with their egos clashing. Which, honestly, it bothered me for 0.2 seconds, and then I was like, nah, that's just the male ego. Right, it's completely, like, it makes sense. I was like- And it's it's their personalities, uh, like, High King versus Prince who doesn't know anything. Seriously? Yeah. Caspian's such a little angsty boy. Yeah. He kind of annoyed me this time around. Like, it sucks, because with movies- How I feel about it depends on how I'm doing that day. So, like, yesterday I was just irritated all day. So the fact that he was annoying me could very well have just been me being annoyed. (laughs) I think he's annoying. (laughs) Yeah, he was being kind of annoying. Let's be real. Normally I'm just like, oh my gosh, I love him. But yesterday I was like, you need to stop. Like... You don't know what you're doing. You haven't led these people before. You don't know what's going on. Let them help you. Yeah. The next 45 minutes or so of this movie is where I got confused. Mostly the first time. Okay. So I completely missed the scene where caspian's uncle is talking to his people about how many weapons did they steal and yeah (laughs) like you should you were right to be afraid of the woods like that Mm -hmm. whole scene missed completely that's definitely a major plot point (laughs) i mean i don't actually think that was that important of a plot point they stole weapons and the 
I mean, it's just like the the Uncle Mraz or whatever his name is yeah. is like surprise. It's actually Caspian the whole time that we don't like, but it's the turning point of the war though. Because before, they were like, oh, well, we don't know. We just need to kind of find Caspian, whatever. But when he orders his own man to kill his men and pin it on Caspian, because Miraz is like, how many men did you lose? And the guy goes, I didn't lose any. They came in the dead of night. We didn't see them. And he asks again, how many men? And the guy kind of looks for a second and he's like, three. Meaning they're pinning all of this on Caspian, which is another thing that happens later that makes everyone go insane. Yeah. They could have just pinned the next battle on Caspian and it would have had the same effect. Yeah, it wasn't super necessary I guess the biggest thing was that they needed weapons, so it's like, oh, well, we need to know the reaction of losing weapons, whatever. Yeah, so Caspian leads the gang to a safe house cave thing, Mm -hmm. and they discover Aslan's stone table there. They speak really cryptically for a while about what's going on, and then eventually decide that the best plan of action is to go to the castle and make the first move. Well... Peter decides that nobody agrees with him. <laughs> yeah. Rip. Yeah. Lucy's like, no, that's really dumb. And Peter's like, we're not waiting for Aslan any longer. And I'm like, no, I really think you should, sir. <laughs> yeah. And it, of course, goes horribly. Yeah. Caspian's yeah. idea wasn't any better, but he just yeah. wanted to show off. He just wanted to show his power. And that was another one of those humility things. And, like, it was just another... That whole thing... Oh, it hurts my soul. It's a lot. Yeah. I zoned out basically this whole point, And then I, like, zoned back in right when they started fighting in the castle. And I was like, why are we doing this? Like, what's happening? Oh, no. See, you really gotta pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was that like crazy of a movie. I've just this has always been something I've loved. So seeing it kind of for the first time again was like, whoa, wait a minute. I just kind of took all this for granted. I just kind of knew this. Yeah. Just it's just a lot of switching back and forth, a lot of following, a lot of a lot of information all at once, all the time. Mm-hmm. There's no point in this movie where you can pause and, like, catch up on everything that happened. It yeah. just keeps going and going and going and going. And then eventually you're like, wait, I missed something and I'm confused. Yeah. But they go into the castle and I have no idea what their original plan was. To let the gate down, catch them by surprise, kill Mraz. Okay, great. So they don't do that. Nope. Caspian Caspian... gets distracted because he realizes the doctor's been captured, and so he goes off, and Peter's like, no, we need to stick to the plan, and Susan's like, it'll be fine, whatever. Thanks, Susan. You're the best. She's always taking Caspian's side, which again is really stupid because she doesn't know this guy. She knows how Peter leads. Why would she take a stranger's side? Because he's hot. (laughs) That makes me mad. (laughs) Like, she's supposed to be the logical one. And that just... That's what really made it worse. Like, I knew Caspian was going to get emotional. Whatever. We all knew that was going to happen. There's always that catharsis moment. Whatever. But the fact that Susan sided with him... I'm like, no. That's too far. Definitely yeah. not. Susan's character fascinates me. I don't think the movies do a very good job of her. Yeah. Like, writing her. Or maybe it's just the actress's fault. I don't know. But I'm interested to read the books just to see her 
character in more detail, especially yeah. having looked up what happens during the end. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to look at and explore. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said, like, liter- or, like literature-wise about her, like, as a character. Mm-hmm. Like, I could write essays about it. Yeah, the fall of Susan, like... Yeah. And, like, what does Susan's character have to show about feminism, about women, and, like, all of these other things? Mm-hmm. But I can't get that from just from a movie, so... Right. No. You can't. Yeah. So, Caspian goes to save the professor, and then the professor's like, don't underestimate him, and then we discover that Mraz killed his dad. Yeah, it's really funny to me how the professor's like, I literally set you free so that- Why did you come back, you idiot? (laughs) And that made me laugh. Because, like, same. I would have done the same thing in Caspian's shoes, and that makes me laugh because whoever I would have been saving would have said the same thing. Like, (laughs) what are you doing, you dummy? Yes. So then Caspian tries to kill his uncle, and the plan just falls apart from there. Yep. The bridge doesn't get open in time. Now everybody knows that they're there. It turns into a full-on battle. The alarm sounds so that it's not a surprise. It's just a regular battle. Yeah. And they lose a lot of men and have to retreat. The worst part of the movie. Not the worst as in the worst, but, like, it always broke my heart. No. Every time I watch that scene, it just, like... It shattered something in me. Yeah, when I watched it, I was shocked. Yeah. I was like, this is so much worse, like, darker and more intense than I was expecting a Narnia movie to be. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of my favorite scenes in a dark kind of way. Just seeing Peter's face as he has to leave all of his men behind to die. It, I can't even describe that face, like, is always etched in my mind. Like, if you're like, oh, that scene with Peter, I'm like, oh, God. (laughs) It hurts. Because he's just like, what have I done? Like, this is what my lack of humility did. It killed all of these people. And then he gets called out on it and is like, well... And then tries to blame Caspian, and I'm like, well, listen, Caspian did mess up, but you're the one who said it in the first place, so. Awkward. Yes. (laughs) And the silence after the battle, because this, these movies are so good with the music. This, the resolutions in the music don't even get me started. It's so phenomenal it's such a fantasy type it does so well with fantasy and with the battles and it's so well done but then when there's just silence and you see all the fallen you're like oh no (laughs) yes so they go back and they regroup and they fight a little bit and then and then i got confused again I've seen it twice now and I still don't get it. Where Caspian almost summons the White Witch and this whole thing, these weird people show up and I'm, I just don't know why that scene was there. Um, it was one of those where it's like, here, take the easy way out. Like, temptation-wise. Because the Telmarines don't associate with the White Witch. They don't associate with anything magical. So it's basically introducing or reintroducing a villain. It's a little out of place because the Telmarines are already the villain in this movie, but it also shows Edmund's redemption arc of, I get it, you guys don't have to explain yourselves. It's the best way for Peter and Caspian to both get knocked down to size. 
Yeah, that makes sense. They just keep bringing the White Witch back, and I'm like, she's gone. Let's just move on. <laughs> well, they had a way to bring her back. That's the thing. Like, she no, was I almost just mean back. like, like the story, like the movie itself, keeps mentioning the White Witch and like bringing her back because it also happens in Dawn Treader, yeah. where they mention the White Witch again, and I'm just like, why? Just let it go. <laughs> yeah. Because there are it still didn't... people that follow her. Like, that dwarf in particular, that was his whole thing the whole time. Like, in the book especially, he's very dark. You can tell he's a villain. And you're like, what? Where is this going? Okay. Yeah, I just think that whole thing is something else that got lost in the translation between books and movies. Because mm-hmm. the movie, the first, like, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe did not seem to make the White Witch to be as much of a dark, cryptic, controlling, nightmare type of figure. Like, are you sure? Like, in the sense that she's the villain and they defeated the villain, but it didn't seem that she had given a lot of long-standing trauma. But, I mean, she did have control over literally everything. Yeah, but they just resolved it all so nicely that I never gave it a second thought. They're like, oh, she beat her, and then they keep trying to bring it up. And it's not like a... It was very hard to see her hand in everything in the movie. And then they defeated her so easily, and everything just went back to normal. And it was like, the end, great. And then... Every single movie yeah. after that, they were like, oh, you remember the White Witch? Like, she's still around. Like, people still follow her. And I'm like, wait, they do? I guess... Not to get, like, super metaphorical or anything. It could just be a good reflection of how... You don't... Especially in the modern world, you don't see so much of the spiritual... You see more spiritual things happen in more third world countries, in other places. So there isn't as much. The Narnians, they were way more focused on Aslan, but there were still followers of the White Witch. Kind of like in Harry Potter, (laughs) where... (laughs) Or I just read this yesterday, where the... What is it? The Death Eaters? Yeah. They came and it's like, well, there's still followers of Voldemort? Yeah. Because he's still a thing. Like, you didn't remember that? (laughs) The difference, I think, between Harry Potter and this is that Harry Potter, like, up until the fourth book where you're at, they do make it intentional to be like something suspicious is going on these people that turn out to be death eaters are bad people yeah and they just like there's just not enough time in the in the narnia movies to talk about the long-standing effects of the white witch but they still keep mentioning the white witch so it feels weird to me to be like i'm not saying that there's not effects because clearly there are and there are in the books I'm assuming. Yeah. It's just in the movie, there's not enough time to talk about it. And then they keep bringing her up as if they had time to talk about the effects. Yeah. I think the other big thing is when they're, when the badger and the dwarf have Caspian in the tree and Caspian's explaining all this stuff, the dwarf does say like, you know, things were better when the white witch was around. Like there's still more of us out there. And the badger's like, bro, what? (laughs) Like, So that is, it's another one of those very subtle things that just kind of goes by. Yeah, I miss that, so. Yeah, so when you see that again, you'll be like, oh, he did say that. Now we understand why he's like a weird minion. He's like the evil of dear little friend, which is funny to me. Like, evil parallel. He's a spoil. (laughs) Yeah. I know things. So they have that weird scene with the White Witch. Edmund saves the day because he's a hero and I love him. And then 
they have like the battle begins and the last hour of the movie is this battle and yeah. i will admit i skipped over a lot of it that's the best part okay don't forget okay, I, I, it's okay today when i watched it i remembered a lot of it from when i had watched it and that's i was fair. just tired of watch. i was tired of watching the movie at that point and so i was like skipping to when the scene changed so i like knew what was going on no but, that's definitely fair if you just watched it all the fighting, you know what's happening. I thought it was interesting. Um, the reason that battle started was because they sent Edmund over to the other camp to Moraz, holding olive branches, and he has this decree from Peter, and he's got some funny quips. Love that for Edmund. Super sarcastic bean. Love him for this movie. (laughs) Sorry. I just love Edmund in general. Last movie, he really bothered me. This movie, he knew his place. (laughs) That's the thing. He had a redemptive arc. He grew up. And that's why I like him more. Yeah. I just like him better in the first movie because I know where he ends up. I know that he's just a misguided little boy that grows up to be the hero. That's definitely fair. I will give you We all have to start somewhere. Yikes. That was one of the things that I didn't get, is that they, like, sent Edmund to the king to be like, let's do a duel instead of a battle to, like, Mm. give Lucy and Susan time to, like, go find Aslan. But I feel like a duel would just go by much faster than a full-on battle. Yeah, they just didn't want to lose more people than they absolutely needed to until that point, and they knew Peter could beat him. That's the other thing. They That's knew fair. Peter could last long enough to give them enough time. That was the most important part. That's understandable. That battle, listen, that little duel, that's probably, like, my favorite thing in the whole world. I I love Peter, obviously. Um, I love that when they first started, he had the high ground. I think that needs to be said. (laughs) And the camera work for that scene is so incredible. There's literally a point where it looks like Peter is stabbing you as the audience, like swinging at you because the camera is where Mirage should be. And it's so incredible to just, like, be in that moment and soak it in. Like, I am here. I am all in. The camera work in this whole movie is really nice. Phenomenal. And I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Just the whole yeah. thing. So they duel, and we see the resolution of Peter's arc, where he realizes that he needs to be more humble. He Doesn't he let Caspian do the final kill he doesn't do the final but he like hands it off to Caspian yes, to finish he's off the like, duel he gets Mraz to his knees and Mraz is like okay finish me off and he's like that's not my job that's that's not what I'm here for I did what I needed to do also like don't hurt Peter my precious son I love him he's so much older than us <laughs> <laughs> He's like 33. <laughs> um, it's fine. Don't talk about Ben Barr. <laughs> uh, Mr. 40 year old man. He's only um, 38. Thank you very much. <laughs> I thought he was 40. No, he's 38. You're sure? I'm 100% sure. Okay, relax. <laughs> Golly. And now I have to check just to make sure. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. He's not 40. (laughs) Okay, just kidding. He's 39. Turning 40! Yeah, you're right. I just saw it on Twitter. 40 at this moment. Oh my gosh. His birthday's in August. (laughs) We're gonna fight. We're gonna fight about Ben Barnes, and honestly, isn't that the content you came here for? Yeah. Okay. 
So, hands it off to Caspian. <laughs> Let's just segue. Well, first, I should say that Caspian took care of Susan and Lucy while <laughs> while Peter was busy. That's one of my favorite lines. He's like, um, you were a little occupied. And he's like, thanks, man. Because Peter loves his siblings more than anything. Yeah. This is... It annoys me that Susan keeps entering into close combat battles with only her bow and arrow. I'm, I'm like, rolling girl, my eyes. You can't. You need a knife. <laughs> Literally, just so that's that's what happens is that she's like trying to fight all these guys that are running past her with a bow and arrow, and then Caspian saves the day. And I'm like, you wouldn't need help if you just knew how to do hand to hand combat. <laughs> It was literally with one guy, too. I thought it was more than one person. It was just one guy. I was like, she could handle herself. Get out of here. Yeah. That made me mad. I was like, shut but up. Dumb. Caspian comes back, and he doesn't kill his uncle because he's better than that. He's yeah. a good person. He's overcome his revenge. And yeah. then... Miraz's men kills him and blames it on the Narnians, and a full-out battle begins. Yeah. So that's where the second piece of, oh, Caspian is awful, let's pin everything on him, that's where that comes into play. And it's like, huh, okay. Awkward. But Lucy finds Aslan, and Aslan reawakes the forest, and the trees come to fight, and they win the battle. Yeah, I think the other thing, like, the catapult thing was, I don't know, kind of cool. Just how, that was how Care Paravel was, huh, I just Englishified that, eh, gross, <laughs> super Americanized, um, but how that was destroyed, and they were trying to do the exact same thing to Aslan's tomb, and he's like, nah, JK. Yeah. Happy, happy times. So everything's good. Peace is here. Caspian gives a speech about how either you're with me or you're against me. And well, he first he gives Reaper Cheap a, Aslan gives Reaper Cheap his tail back. Because oh, he lost so in the sweet. battle. All of his little mice buddies were like, because of his honor, sir, we will cut our own. And oh my gosh, this is so sweet. I can't. Oh. He's like, it's, it's so not cute. even for you. It's for the honor of your men and for the honor that you are going to show. He's like, I owe you my life. I have humility for the rest of my days. I'm like, stop. Caspian gives a speech and Aslan's like, you guys aren't from here. <laughs> you guys are actually from this island because you guys were pirates. So if you want to go back, you can go back. <laughs> and some people go back and then they're like, how do I know you're not sending them to their death? And Peter's like, okay, we'll go. Yeah. And Lucy and Edmund are like, wait, I don't want to go. <laughs> yeah. And we learn that Peter and Susan are not coming back because they've learned all that they can from Narnia, but Lucy and Edmund are going to come back one day. That part always upset me. Like, because I love Peter so much, obviously. But as a kid, I didn't understand. I was like, what do you mean? Like, this this place is so amazing. Why wouldn't you let them come back? It was always so upsetting. Yeah, I think there's something to be said. Not necessarily that, like, Narnia is just for children. But that Narnia is a place to learn and to help you grow. And it's almost more of a metaphor that way than an actual place. Mm -hmm. It's like, through Narnia, I learned how to be a better person. Through Narnia, I learned how to grow up and be a man and be a good leader and all of these things. Yeah. And once you've learned that lessons, like, now you're ready to go out into the world. Mm -hmm. You're ready to grow up. And you're ready to be the person that you're supposed to be. And Lucy and... Or, Susan and Peter are grown up now, and so they've learned all they can, and now they have to use what they've learned. Mm hmm It's just upsetty spaghetti, man. Yeah, the ending of these movies are always so bittersweet. 
This one especially is so sad. <laughs> Only because of the one song that will make my brother cry every time. The song is so sad. The Call by Regina Spector. It is a masterpiece. I yeah. love my favorite thing is when Lucy looks back right before she leaves and she looks Aslan in the face and the song goes, I'll come back when you call me. And I was like, oh, Aww. stop. No. It just, it really does something to you. Yeah. Susan and Caspian kiss for some reason and they hug and then Susan's like, peace out, I'm never gonna see you again. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. I guess this way she can say that she her first kiss was with a king. <laughs> Not that anyone be would believe her in the real world. But... Yeah, like, whatever. That's so dumb. <laughs> and the saddest movie ending song of all time enters, and they're back on the train station, no time has passed, and they have to go back to the real world. And Edmund's like, oh no, I left my flashlight. <laughs> no. No. He calls it a torch, but that's what they call oh, no. flashlights. I left my new torch in Narnia. The best ending line of a movie I done ever heard. And then the movie ends. And that's Prince Caspian. I just need to know, for anyone who knows technology, so I was writing notes into my phone. Why is it? That when I typed new torch into my phone, a flashlight showed up. That's because what I want to know. A torch is what British people call flashlight. It's the same thing. I'm just not British. I didn't know they... That's dumb. I'm <laughs> mad. I thought it was like a cool, like, Narnia thing. No. Just no, dumb. it's a British thing. Freaking Edmund. So, you know what? I blame him for this. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> Good. So, what are the Rotten Tomato and audience, critic and audience scores for this movie? Oh my gosh. The last one didn't have an audience score, so this one might not either. Yeah, we'll just do one just in case. Um, critic... 75. Audience, 80. Okay, I'm gonna do... Critic, 62. Audience, 70. Okay. The critic score is a 66, and the audience score is a 73. Dang, you were really close. Holy crap. I'm getting better at this. You can just read minds. Fine. Whatever. Just try my best. So, what score do you give this? Listen. <laughs> Send help. I just, I'm keeping track of what I rate, at least the Narnia movies. Um, I can tell you. You gave the last Narnia movie an 8.5. No, I just, for my own sake, for my own, like, emotional st stability, I've been keeping track. I just, it also, I don't know, I'm having a hard time with this one. <laughs> this is rough. This is a rough time. I... I'm gonna give it another eight and a half. I was gonna rank it higher at one point. I was gonna rank it lower at another point. I kept going back and forth. I was like, well, I don't know if it's equal to Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Whatever. I still love this movie. I... I know I have a little more context with having seen it so many times, with having read the books, at least the three of the movies that I've seen. So that helps. Yeah. Um, but 
It does. That's just... Yeah. Ben Barnes is at least eight of those points. Well, I gave it a 6.25, so... That stings. But when you talk about it for an hour about how much you hate it, it only I don't makes hate sense. it. <laughs> Jeez, Jade. I've given other movies worse than this. Yeah. Do you really want to go there right now? Do you really want to find me right now? I just so... love things a lot. <laughs> and apparently that's not okay. <laughs> You're allowed to love your things. Uh, I, I can't just... ever be objective. <laughs> you came into this podcast with me. You've known me your whole life. You should have expected this. I was not ready for Die Hard. I was not ready for you to hate that. These, I, I was don't a little... hate it. Hate it would be giving it a two. I think it's all right. It's a oh, solid middle ground. Lord. How many times do I have to say this to you? A five just feels like a zero in my mind. <laughs> like, it's a scale from zero to ten, Jade. It's I right know, in the middle. And it just hurts. It's painful. It'd be like if I rated Miraculous Ladybug a two. Wouldn't that hurt? That's your opinion. If you think it's a two, then it's a two. It doesn't make me love it less. Ah. <laughs> uh. I'm just crazy. Okay, together we gave it a seven. I can live with that. I'll stop having a breakdown now. <laughs> Great. I think every week I just have a breakdown about Die Hard. <laughs> As it should be. If you haven't watched our Die Hard episode, please do that. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> All right, Jade, do you want to close this out? Yeah, did I have any other. Ow. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from this movie is probably the best thing in the world um, is definitely Peter yelling fall back during a battle even though that's not a great thing to hear during a battle that you really want to be winning it's just probably my favorite thing in the world if you get me you get me okay uh, <laughs> we have social media we have twitter i just tweeted about trains um we I also have to that tweet we also have an Instagram at Curly Critics Pod. We have a Gmail at Curly Critics Pod at gmail.com. Um, you know the drill. Tweet us. Great. The Curly Critics are a proud member of the WBE Network, which has eight great shows to listen to. One of them is Hello from Elsewhere, where Casey and Valerie Winters talk about themes and other pop culture stuff every other Friday. Here's I a promo. I love them. Do you find yourself thinking deeply about pop culture? Do you wish for a super nerdy podcast that explores your favorite movies and books? Well, look no further. From WBNE, it's Hello from Elsewhere. On our podcast, we promise to literally transport you to all your favorite fictional settings. I don't think we can actually promise that. Yes, we can. Travel with us to the Death Star. We can't put people in harm's way like that. Or visit beautiful new Asgard. That's so many plane tickets to Norway. Explore the eras of Jane Austen or Frankenstein. Metaphorically, we don't know how to implement time travel we do now on hello from elsewhere we're gonna get in trouble with these promises with new episodes every other friday hello from elsewhere is available wherever you find your podcasts yes that part is true you can even listen on the hogwarts express oh boy okay uh check out our patreon at patreon.com slash curly critics pod lots of tears yeah, not the bad kind of tears the tears with an eye Maybe some other tears. I don't... I hope not. I hope you only cry <laughs> tears of joy listening to us. Uh, 
Or just tears of confusion. Like, I don't know why they keep talking about beavers. I'm pretty sure they're real. Don't worry. Beavers are not real. Yeah, no, they're not. Sorry. Neither are birds, but we all know that. Yeah, that one's obvious, but like, beavers though? You know what is real? Ben Barnes. He's real. Yes, he is. He real Thank fine. You for he real fine. Okay, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.